Uh, welcome everybody to um, Intimacies in Asia in a time of pandemic and this is one of the few great things that have happened in this period that we can have a seminar like this um, on Zoom with so many friends scattered all over the place. Uh, so welcome and it's, it's wonderful to see you. Um, our speakers are going to go in the order uh, and the invitation. And we'll start with Olivia Koo from the University of Melbourne, uh, Film and Screen Studies. And she has a book, um, The Chinese Exotic, Modern Diasporic Femininity. But I particularly want to plug um, the book she mm. co-authored with Belinda Smale and Audrey Yu many years ago, Transnational Australian Cinema, which I think is the best book ever about Australian cinema, but it doesn't get promoted enough. So we'll start with you, Olivia. Thank you very much, Megan, for that. Um, and thanks to you and Tom for the invitation to speak today. Can you all hear me okay? A bit low. Sure. Yes, you're Bye. a bit low, Olivia. Okay, I might pump that That's up. Is that, is that a bit better? Much. Great, thank you. Um, so I must admit I'm a bit fried. I, I actually submitted a book, a book, I submitted a book manuscript yesterday for another book on Asian cinema and I've been homeschooling my child now for six weeks with um, maybe another two or three weeks to go. So uh, all the other Victorians will sympathise with me. You can see Fran there. Um, so um, I, I'm glad this was a five minute talk because I think that's probably as much as I have to say. Um, and you'll excuse me for um, not having very much to say about intimacies in Asia, but I hope you'll permit me to say something about intimacies in Asian Australia, um, given the very local nature of our, our experiences today. So what I wanted to do was to raise the spectre of rising racism and abuse against Asian Australians and how we might live intimately in diaspora post pandemic, if not now. I'm sure I don't need to recount for you all the many instances of racism against Asian Australians, from the brutal attack against two international students in Melbourne CBD, to racist graffiti and name calling against Chinese Australians. So severe has this racism been that PM Scott Morrison was compelled to give a press conference telling Australians to stop it. That's my message, just stop it. And this is very similar to how I speak to my nine year old when he's done something naughty. We've been told to stay local, to shop local, but how can we act in a way that extends beyond our locality to create forms of intimate solidarity? And I'm reminded here of Christine Kim's book, The Minor Intimacies of Race, in which she explores the kinds of conversations, gestures and feelings that produce intimacy between individuals within Asian American and Asian Canadian publics. Um, and she explores examples from literature and film to YouTube parodies. And we can contrast these minor intimacies, for instance, against the major intimacies that Lisa Lowe writes about in The Intimacies of Four Continents, which occur between and across empires and nation states historically and over time. So I've been thinking about some of the things that have been happening within Australia, um, including activist campaigns circulating on social media. Um, for instance, the I am not a virus hashtag, to the circulation of internet memes, creating imaginative spaces through the intimacy of humour. And I was thinking of other examples that we could hopefully talk about um, that exemplify how humour has been used in this kind of intimate way in this time. Um, to, to the generous acts of individuals and communities who have been feeding and housing international students out of work. Um, and I'd like to refer to these as examples of minor intimacies that mobilise collective feelings outside of the official discourses of reprimand being offered by the state. So if the only message that we're getting from the top is to stop it, clearly the impetus is on us to find ways to start things from the ground up by creating new intimate publics formed not solely or necessarily through claims of identity, but through shared feeling and contingent forms of social engagement. Um, and I'd suggest that these are ways to counter the very impersonal acts of racism that will remain long after this pandemic is over. So I guess the main things that I wanted to, to bring up is this idea of, of how we might utilize minor intimacies um, within um, forms of solidarity with Asian Australians and some of the different examples that are occurring now, not only through social media, but also kind of different acts that community group 
things um, I'm doing um, to help get a form of, I guess, um, sentiment of feeling that we are in support of, uh, you know, the kind of plight against Asian Australians, while the message that we're getting from the government is just very different from, from this kind of discourse of, of intimacy. Just stop it, just stop it <laughs> message. Um, thank you. Thank you, Olivier. So the next speaker is Hans Huang, whom I can't see right now. He must be over the page. Who's, yeah, um, a leading figure in the globally important sexuality movement in Taiwan, um, but also teaches in the English department uh, at National Central University. And he's the author of Queer Politics and Sexual Modernity in Taiwan and is, has edited enormously around HIV, AIDS and sexuality and cultural studies on these topics. Uh, and he has a new project on the genealogy of the queer left in Taiwan, which will be just a massive job, I would imagine. Um, but so over to you, Hans. Little bit of audio glitch there. <laughs> Sorry, um, my um, this problem was my laptop, so I, I'm gonna have to use Fifi's um, spot. That's fine. Okay, hello everyone. Um, I'm um, just going to um, talk a bit about my uh, reflection of recent time. Um, so I've been following closely um, about China's response to COVID-19 outbreak in Wuhan and was struck by the scene of intimacy in intensive, in intensive care units where emotional support is mediated by kinship tropes of everyday social interaction. And with Chinese tradition addressing elder patients as aunt and uncle, the professional uh, work of, take, of care takes on a layer of assumed intimacy that allows individual patients to feel connected to strangers with relative care ease as they undergo a medical process that bans family companionship. Interestingly, this fictive uh, kinship also fits nicely into the making of national solidarity and fraternity as embodied in the 119 medical teams dispatched from the, uh, the other provinces in, Ch in China to support Wuhan during the crisis. Uh, medical workers, though separated from their own family, a profound sense of duty to the nation, dedicating themselves to uh, the people's war against COVID-19. This sentiment resonates with popular memories of wartime mutual aid and collective resistance to imperial powers throughout modern uh, Chinese history. And by comparison, this mode of strong collective feeling is completely missing from Taiwan's response to COVID-19 as younger generation grown by West Western individualism offer only disdain for this kind of commentary. Last May, on the day gay marriage was passed, um, legalized, a Facebook friend posted a selfie in the gym celebrating fa father and mother, husband and wife are now gone. Um, and it, I, I find it interesting that gays coming out now proudly present themselves as orphans, endowed with a sense of entitlement to um, individual autonomy. So to complicate the stories a bit, I recall a classic Taiwanese queer novel uh, called Notes of a Desolate Man, published in 94 by novelist Zhu Tianwen. So set in the, against the backdrop of the early 90s uh, with the rise of Taiwanese nationalism, uh, the novel uses the figure of a desolate gay man as an allegory for the perceived marginalization on the part of the second generation manlanders. So with the queerness of those deemed suspect Taiwanese, the desolate men uh, growing up un under martial law um, also find himself alienated, alienated not only by 
the entering of the self-centered younger gener consumer generation, but also by uh, the US style AIDS activism taken up by his best friend. Um, because it's in your face style uh, tactic entails a kind of self-righteousness that impedes actually for real uh, dialogues for change. The novel then raises an important question. What happens when homosexuality as the emblem of hybrid individuality and individualism is the link from kinship ties and the symbolically removed from cultural roots? Three decades on, uh, this question becomes even more pressing as the enemy of the present Taiwanese younger generation finds its nihilistic outlook in the form of queer liberalism. It's a liberalism that universalizes the elation of open queers as the end of history to the neglect of messy intimacies sustained by those displaced under the dest destructive forces of economic development within the structure of neo-colonial dependency. One example of the a site of such messy intimacies would be a makeshift uh, peasant farm in the 80s Taiwan, run by a group of lower rank Chinese soldiers, China Japanese War and Civil War. They were among the two million people, uh, two million people that fled with Chiang Kai-shek's exile government to Taiwan in 49. And later with the ensuing Cold War division, uh, these for subsistence. While the advent of um, COVID-19 has spelled an end uh, to the end of history myths, the official rendering of the pandemic as Wuhan pneumonia in Taiwan reiterates the logic of Cold War quarantine, uh, the history of which people in Taiwan have not yet come to terms with. So young pro queer progressives, I think, might do well to rethink this geography of blame in the wake of the Cold War. Reciting the mantra in HIV education that virus does not discriminate is not really helpful in this case. These outcasts of Cold War modernity as our big uncles as we fight to recreate kinship and intimacies in this age of growing antagonism. Thank, Thank you, you, Hans. Thank you. You broke up just a little bit in the sound at some points, but people can come back in. I, I, wonder, okay. if, <laughs> I wonder if Hans could just repeat his just last little four or five sentences. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I said, uh, um, so while the, while COVID-19, the advent of COVID-19 has spelled an end to the end of his history myths, the official rendering of the pandemic as Wuhan pneumonia in Taiwan currently reiterates the logic of Cold War quarantine, uh, the history of which uh, people in Taiwan have not yet to come to terms with. And I think young people, young queer progressives in Taiwan might do well to rethink this geography of blame in the wake of the new Cold War. Uh, uh, reciting the mantra in HIV education that, that virus does not discriminate is not really help, helpful in this context. Uh, I think it would be more productive to try to relate to this old uh, outcasts made by uh, in Cold War modernity as our big uncles, those old veteran soldiers as our big uncles, as we fight to recreate kinship uh, and intimacies in this age of growing antagonism. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hans. I can see a few people wanting to respond immediately, but I'd ask you to wait till we've had the panel uh, and make a note of your questions and comments and we'll come back at the end. So the next speaker will be very familiar to everybody at Sydney Uni, except those of you who only arrived this year. Uh, Henry did his uh, masters with us quite recently, and I know it's held up 
to everybody incoming who works on queer issues in Asia as something that must be read, but it's now published, I believe, as Intimate Assemblages, the Politics of Queer Identities and Sexualities in Indonesia. Um, and Hendry specialises in writing for a mainstream audience, which is something a lot of us grew up with, but it's harder and harder to do in Australia these days. So Henry, your turn. Okay. Um, thank you, Megan. So I'm going to uh, show my presentation slides here. So um, my presentation aims to explain explore the idea of intimacy through philanthropy practices in Indonesia during these COVID pandemics. So by uh, linking those uh, philanthropic practices with queer histories and practices, particularly during the AIDS epidemic, I'm going to highlight how the idea of intimacy is a matter of affective investment rather than only a matter of um, proximity and familiarity. So now in Indonesia, working from home has been an official policy across the country. The public discourse always associates a uh, home with 100% safety, but apparently, and in the practice itself, at home, to be able to function as usual, we need the infrastructures and resources from rent, food supply, internet connection, as well as mental health support. Situating this, this emerging precarity, particularly in this current gig economy, in this neoliberal era, I've been looking at how people are start thinking about the precarity that are being faced by motorbike taxi drivers in Indonesia. Because the gig economy in Indonesia has prompted people, actually in this neoliberal era as well, to be some sort of service providers in a way that they are not really recognized as employees in the traditional concept of employment. As a service providers, then they use their bodies, they use their own personal assets to, to work, and also they are highly reliant on a casual basis income, in which in this COVID pandemic, um, a lot of motorbike taxi drivers are not allowed to take passengers and orders so that their daily income has decreased significantly. So now, um, what is very interesting and also intriguing in this current landscape is how a, a pattern of philanthropy and care uh, are emerging from the public, uh, from the public, especially people suddenly think how those uh, motorbike taxi drivers face, uh, are facing precarity because of their income loss. And then, through the program Treat Your Drivers or AKA Strangers, many public campaigns are carried out through partnerships between restaurants, motorbike taxi users, general public, and also the gig companies themselves, right? So in looking at this new, uh, this, this care um, ecosystem, I try to link it with the gay uh, practices during the AIDS pandemic in the 1980s to the 1990s or the early 2000s. So this is quite interesting because there are three points that I'm going to highlight. So first, in this kind of collective intimacy, actually, it's, I feel like I'm go, it's, it's just like going to the gay bathhouses, you know, when you are suddenly, you form a collective care with strangers that you don't really, that you are not familiar with, right? So this is, uh, I guess, reminds me about uh, Dennis Altman's uh, analysis of gay bad houses in which affective investments are being exercised with the strangers to protect them as well from uh, any uh, infections, for example. The second point is also how this kind of practice 
also resonates with the strategy of zero sorting among gay people when we actually with more privilege, we assess the risk that are distributed unevenly in this period uh, to uh, across different groups like motorbike taxi drivers, students, and etc. And in this case, we this kind of assessment leads to a decision-making point in choosing an act to help. Last but not least, I want to highlight also cane raised notions of intimate experiments. With the, with the emerging um, technological platform, actually this kind of care strategy has been enabled at a distance in a way that you can use your apps to form a collective care, a kind of philanthropic practices to help these motorbike taxi drivers. But of course, the critics would argue that what I've taught here is actually a form of individual individualization of problem or a form of neoliberal care strategy. But I guess in this precarious time, I think this is, it is very important for us to do something and also to remind ourselves that agency and our activist strategy is always, are always bounded and structured within the existing structures. So all we can do now is to push it forward whenever we can. So that's the end of my presentation. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Henry. The next speaker is Tina Fei, otherwise known as Fifi. And she's a colleague of Hans, uh, both at National Central University and English Department and the um, historically very significant Center for the Study of Sexualities. She's written an awesome book. I recommend to anybody who knows nothing about Chinese literature and wants to plunge into something extraordinary um, called, I was forget the title, Obscene Things, Sexual Politics in Jinping Mei. Uh, you, if you read this book, you will come out feeling you know everything there is to know about classical Chinese patriarchal views and you will want to run to the ends of the earth. Uh, no is a very important activist, both for teaching and learning and cultural studies in gender politics and the study of sexuality. Fifi. Is it? That's okay. it. Okay. You're good. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Megan, and thank you, Tom, and thank you, everyone. Um, um, and hello from Zhongli uh, Sex Center, um, where Hans and I are. Um, uh, and I, I, I wanted to speak on uh, the last few months of uh, online news media and how they have represented privatized care and education of what is called social reproduction institutions, such as prisons, care homes, and familial homes as households set apart, separated in and by social distancing, saturated by different lockdown measures. In some reports, familial homes are positively marked for security, while care homes, worker dorms, and prisons have been reported on as negative hotspots. These have become households of different scale in pandemic-related reports, linked in spikes of high-risk high and bursts of violence in bureaucratic managerial procedures that throw up negative intimacies arising from inherited hierarchies that are obstructed from view. Nations are reported on in nearly gender-washing manner, ranking how female leadership in certain countries are doing better than others, stressing negative comparison with states under corrosive male leadership doing badly. The focus and manner of comparison highlights divisive valuation while hiding possible shared problems and pointedly not addressing historical and structural differences as well as affinities. This results in hiding 
the generalization of assumed shared values based on single focus, in this case, gendered leadership, within the mediation that is the comparative frame itself. At the same time, in some of these best COVID-19 practice countries, including where I am, household lockdown has led to the fear of increase in the fear of and the reality of increase in domestic violence with women, children, but also some men as victims. In East Asia, there is also media purience with possible social violence facilitated through state tracking and transparency measures, as in the case of media outing a young housewife moonlighting as a popular wine house entertainer, also resulting in the closing of entertainment industry, of course. Media reports have highlighted the seeming rise of Enjo Kosai assisted dating in Japan as young women try to escape household lockdown, while a recent cluster in gay bars in Seoul have shown up homophobic media reporting and trolling online. These might be runaways of sorts from familial households with media stalking pushing toward institutionalized castaway status. In wealthy post-colonial countries, higher risks and death from quote unquote underlying ills are clearly accelerated by historical and economic racism in racialized and indigenous households, communities, dorms, and prisons, as well as the sideline peoples become populations in senior care homes and some hospitals as households suddenly seem a little bit like prisons. Perhaps bureaucratically scaled household forms are more like messily bundled and connected and whenever possible moving relations among people who are living against winds of positive and negative idealization in comparative frames that tend to set forms as goals for getting peoples and relations that are irreversibly affected. Thank you. Thank you, Nafe. Um, and our last speaker is our distinguished associate in the Gender and Cultural Studies Department, Helen Grace, um, who, as you will read in her bio, has written widely on intimacy and new media. So this is truly Helen's territory. But I'd like to draw everyone's attention to the uh, daily blog, or her journal of the plague year that um, she's been doing, because a very long time ago, Helen wrote a wonderful um, thesis, I think, on um, bubonic plague in Sydney in 1900 with extraordinary range of photos, uh, and documents and Helen has been updating this every day and it's an absolutely extraordinary site of comparison and reflection. So Helen Grace. Thanks Megan. Uh, can you hear me? Is that uh, sound all right? Okay yeah. great. Well um, I, I because I'm at the end of this I, I, I don't know what capacity we have to sort of um, add more. So I'd like to briefly touch on uh, some of the comments that have been made so far, as well as um, referring to uh, or telling a story and maybe saying a little bit more about the resonances in the blog and some other connections. Um, I'm really grateful for Hans's uh, and, and it's fantastic to see my former colleagues in the sex centre, which is such an awesome place in Taiwan and in the world, really. This is such a groundbreaking and original research centre, but everyone here has benefited from the insights that have been produced over the years in this space. Um, I'm especially grateful, though, to have the really interesting observations that Hans has made about uh, the Cold War in relation to, to the current situation and the, the idea that the Cold War was a quarantine period, uh, which is a really fine insight because, it, and 
uh, and it's fantastic to bring that out precisely in this moment because that certainly was a time of quarantining whole countries and cultures and so on. So, so um, it, it's really useful to be reminded of that. And um, as Henry is talking about the motorbike um, drivers, one of the things that is quite striking in Australia at the moment, and this kind of also goes to, um, to Olivia's points uh, about uh, racism in Australia, and also I suppose about um, just the reality of the current moment. Um, one of the things that is very striking if you go out at night uh, on say a walk um, is that the only traffic in the streets are um, bike riders uh, and all of them are Asian, East Asian, South Asian and so on. So you have a sense of this kind of vulnerability in this time when everyone else is kind of shut up but there is this sort of care work that is being done um, uh, at, at the moment. Um, I just wanted to briefly tell a story of uh, one of my former students, and it, it, it kind of gives us some insight into um, the times, I think, uh, or, or at least it's, it's just one of the things that's happening uh, in the world. Uh, one of my former students uh, who did her PhD at Sydney University and uh, I, she did her MA at UWS when I was there, returned to China, um, took up a position at the Central Academy of Fine Arts where she's now a full professor. Um, she, it's kind of very interesting sort of, her life story is a, is a really interesting one, but uh, one of the things is that she's the daughter of, uh, of parents who were perse persecuted during the Cultural Revolution. So she didn't grow up with her mother, she was, sent to an aunt in uh, another city. And uh, so now we're in this time where she's actually married, but her husband and daughter live in Australia. And they, the family spends time together, like a couple of times a year, uh, summer and winter, depending on, you know, a couple of months in Beijing, a couple of months in Sydney and so on. So that's a kind of familial structure. But now she finds herself stranded in Australia. And it's a really interesting uh, kind of thing, but she's still teaching. She's still doing all her work online and teaching in Beijing. Uh, and we met up in a Chinese restaurant just at the beginning of this whole thing when people had stopped going to Chinese restaurants. And um, so, um, and we'll meet up again sort of pretty soon, but, uh, but it's just kind of very interesting because in a certain sense, she's very happy to be able to spend this extended time with her family but at the same time, it can't be that easy for her because when she was a student in Australia, it was not an easy time. She was a student in Australia at the height of Hansenism so that she was subjected to, you know, the worst of it in a sense, the worst of that kind of racism, as well as finding herself in an economically precarious situation and so on. Um, so it, it's just a, a really interesting um, time and there are many experiences of this kind that, that have been produced by, by the situation. And I'll just finish with a, a quick observation on the, uh, the blog and I'll post, I'll put on to chat a link if, um, um, I can't remember whether in my bio that it was actually included, but I'll repost it. One of the things that was most striking is that, that is so striking about the, the thing and it won't continue for much longer. Um, because there's a certain duration uh, about the whole event that seems to be repeated this time, even though it's a vastly different situation, and the 1900 outbreak. But a real feature of that time was the, uh, the uh, strongly um, anti-Chinese, anti-Asian uh, dimension to the outbreak. Um, and we see that kind of uh, repeated again now in terms of the... Um, the, a certain sort of demonization, I suppose. So that, for example, in 1900, um, Hans mentioned again the, the uh, Wuhan influenza. Well, actually, plague in 1900 was called Oriental Plague. And there was also, at the time, uh, Asiatic Cholera. And the thing about both of those, uh, the designation of both of, 
of those names is, for example, in India, the, the concentration of um, cholera, the greatly increased uh, number of cases, especially uh, at pilgrim sites or, or on pilgrim journeys, that was produced as much as anything, more than anything, really by railways and the, and the concentration of populations in a form that hadn't happened before. So it was really not anything inherent to the population, but purely to the nature of, of imperialism. Uh, and similar, we might say, in terms of uh, the designation Oriental Plague, which of course had been in Europe for you know, 500 years before this outbreak. I, I think I might leave it there and, and uh, look forward to questions and, and further comments. Thanks. Thanks very much, Helen. So um, we have 60 participants uh, who've stayed with us, uh, and, and Tom will basically guide through the uh, order of questions. But I'd ask you, everybody, obviously, to imitate our wonderful speakers, whom I thank for being so disciplined and keep your interventions uh, short and to the point so that everybody can participate. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Um, so we have a first question from Fran. Okay, thanks. I, I didn't realise I was the first. Um, thanks, everyone, for the great presentations. Very thought-provoking. Um, I have a question for Hans, and um, it's kind of, I'll try and do this cogently and, and, and concisely, as, as requested. So, um, I would never want to appear to be supporting the use of the term Wuhan virus. I'm, I'm against that. And maybe what I'm asking here is kind of a devil's advocate question, sort of, but actually I think it's also <laughs> beyond that. Um, in making the argument that um, activists or others or even government figures in Taiwan currently should de-cold war their attitudes in relation to the mainland uncles <laughs> and kind of embrace the uncles in this kind of um, anti-individualist way, I, I get what you're saying there, but I just wonder, is there a level of disingenuousness in, in not maybe recognising something rather specific about the Xi Jinping era um, and wanting to... I mean, I, I, we, we get this kind of Cold War paranoid sinophobia happening massively in Australian public culture, and I often speak out against it. Um, so I'm with you there, but there's, I also think there's something new about the current regime which uh, is not quite the same as things were during the Cold War. And the type of responses we have now then, I would argue, are perhaps distinct and perhaps need a distinct kind of response. So it's maybe a provocation to just say a little bit more about the political side of that, if that's not too much of a drag. <laughs> Thank you. Hans, do you want to respond to that one? I mean, we can collect a few things, but I think that is probably an issue that's in the forefront of quite a few of our minds, that Xi Jinping is kind of a thing, uh, and the way that he has been dealing with it is also part of the current situation. So um, could you, would you like to respond? Um, yeah. Hi, friend. <laughs> Thanks for your question. Um, um, yes, I think the way I would, I mean, we're in a really kind of a complicated and kind of messy situation right now um, in the face as the kind of, there's so much antagonism on, across mm -hmm. trade uh, relations. But um, I think the reason I, bring up uh, Zhu Tianwen's novel, The, the uh, Notes of Desolate Men, that was published in 1994, uh, at, the at the kind of post martial law moment, at the time when you had early age, uh, early queer organizing, and also that was kind of the, as the kind of 
you know, um, the rise of Taiwanese nationalism. And that was a very particular historical moment for me. Uh, if you could, I could say it was a kind of almost the onset of Taiwanese homo nationalism. Right. But uh, uh, the figure of the old, uh, the old Chinese veteran soldiers, they were the kind of targets of hate already back in the 80s, uh, where they were already kind of with the rise of the Han, Hokkien, Taiwanese uh, chauvinism. They were told, just as when they're allowed to kind of return to China to visit, to relink with their family, maybe dead or not. You know, they were just told to kind of fuck off back to China. You know, um, so there was that kind of, um, that kind of, um, uh, you know, to use a strong word, uh, ethnic clean, mm. cleansing or purging already like 30 years ago. So I don't think, you know, this happened just overnight here. I, and, uh, you know, to, so to re recall that kind of distant memory from um, now, I, I, I just think that on a, a kind of um, ground levels where people, uh, given that there's so much kind of traffic and kind of uh, continual interactions amongst the people um, on both sides of the trade, it will kind of, you know, to kind of, to deal with this kind of tension, I think it will be, especially for, for the younger generation, to kind of try to think how would, how they begin to see these um, marginalized people that have been forgotten by history or swept away by history. So uh, I, I, my argument is kind of based on that kind of more grounded levels of everyday life, uh, um, uh, that kind of a, a of, the non-official space of that kind of daily interactions uh, and try to get say for my, to, to enable my students, for example, to relate to people who they might spot in everyday life selling, uh, vending street food, uh, you know, which these old veteran soldiers often end up doing or collecting recycling stuff. Uh, and, and, and try to kind of reconnect them to that bit of, of really thorny, difficult histories that we are still dealing with, uh, particularly in this kind of pandemic time. Thank you. Tom, maybe we should collect two or three comments um, so that everybody gets to at least say something, because... Yeah, we actually haven't got a lot of people in the queue. Oh, okay, good. So Go yeah, I just want, I want to say something there to Hans, that one of the most extraordinary things that I saw during peak Wuhan was videos that people were sending out of their homes. And one of them was a woman completely hysterical and upset and angry and saying, free Taiwan, free Hong Kong, come and get me. Um, and her anger at the urban administration and I think that's a side also of mainland experience and feeling that is not widely, I only saw that because someone sent it to me, I mean most Australians would not see that this material, so yeah. So, uh, Tom? Jane, did you want to? Uh, yeah, um, look thank you so much for that discussion, it's it's not only great to see so many familiar faces, but that was a very stimulating discussion. And I was um, particularly struck by um, something that Fifi said um, towards the end of her talk around um, how people are trapped um, between, or in response to the virus, you get these positive and negative idealizations which set forms as goals. And uh, I took you to be um, partly referencing um, for example, the, the household, the home form. Um, and I loved the parallels that you drew between the household form and, and prisons, for example, how these, you know, forms and structures, um, I mean, a home can be a prison. And, and I loved how you, you, you um, elucidated, you know, um, uh, the structural sorts of violences that can happen in these kinds of places. 
Um, but just in relation to this idea of setting forms as goals and idealizations, I mean, it struck me that, that all of the talks in some ways um, were um, uh, basically wrestling with um, how uh, collectivity and, and notions of kinship um, might be levied to counter the forms of, you know, neoliberal individualism that are rife uh, within the region. Um, and, uh, and, and I was thinking about, um, I mean, I was really taken by Hans's example of ICU workers referring to people in their care as aunties and uncles. So this is a sort of an extension of a particular um, uh, tradition of kinship and, and so on. Um, and I wondered, I mean, is that an idealization of forms or do you see this as something like, more like an experimental intimacy in the sense that Henry was gesturing at? Um, uh, that is the use of certain kinship models or kinship relations to actually um, uh, uh, create bonds of solidarity and care between strangers. And likewise for Hendry, I mean, um, uh, you know, this idea of stranger sociability and experimental intimacies with taxi drivers, I love that example. But I wondered if um, uh, you could talk a little bit more about um, whether and how um, Indonesian uh, sort of notions of family and kinship um, are evoked or operationalized to, to create these new kinds of intimacies. Thank you, uh, Cain, uh, for this, um, I think, clarifying, you know, this, this really kind of important question. I think you're right um, uh, that um, I, w I had in mind uh, both um, the kinds of, um, you know, the nuclear family form, I guess, and its long implementation in various parts of the world mm -hmm. and um, how that um, is made into a goal in, in um, uh, in policies and research, um, and how that then impacts on people who live through these changes and the laws uh, accompanying and forcing these changes. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there ha there has been writing um, that shows how um, uh, the wave of um, post-war um, uh, um, anti-colonial um, revolutions and um, independence is also, um, you know, fueled by um, a need to conform. And this is in our everyday, actually, in, in our everyday media um, comparisons. So are we like enough uh, to certain places? And if we are, then we have somehow um, achieved something. And so I think I, you know, those, um, uh, those comparisons and self comparisons weigh very heavily, I think, on, as Hans was just saying, on even more, you know, the, 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 the this differential access to, uh, to resources, um, as you are marked by this differential access to resources. Um, is there an idealization in the Posi uh, a possibility of um, extending familial terms to impersonal care work, there could be um, if it were to take that turn. It hasn't. And in fact, I, I somehow don't see it precisely yeah. for the reasons that, yeah, yeah, that, that have the other side as preserving it. Uh, for certain relations rather than for others. Yeah. And so, uh, so it, 
it, it's almost as if, yeah. And so it is, it, it is already then idealized negatively, I think, a little bit. And so the difficulty of talking about it um, and, and maybe trying to extend it and so on. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's yeah. really interesting because I take your point about the dangers of the idealization of certain forms. But at the same time, we all have forms that we're informed by and, and that are being put to um, experimental and creative uses in the way that I think Hans and Henry and, and Olivia were all, all talk and, and we're all talking about, yeah. Henry, did you want to add? Oh yes, uh, thank you, Tom, and thanks, Kane, for the question. So actually, uh, the bond that has been formed it through these philanthropic uh, practices actually it's not really based on family or kinship, but rather than it's very much class-based because I've heard a lot of people, a lot of public discourses um, say that, oh, we need to help these marginalized groups right. because they so have no... Sense of precarity, in a sense. Yes, so the notion of the precarity becomes like very dominant in public space. Mm -hmm. And I guess if I am allowed to, I would also address uh, Sharon's questions because it's very connected. So, uh, so, so Sharon asked about how the, my idea of intimate philanthropy differs from uh, social responsibility, civic consciousness and community solidarity. So basically when we talk about first, when we talk about philanthropy here, we always uh, associate it with an, an effort that centered that centers an organization. So it's form of like an organization led uh, initiative, right? Based uh, particularly a very particularly a corporation or a very wealthy organization, but in this case, I, I'm, I'm, I, I, what I see is sometimes it's it's very like publicly public driven. Not re sometimes like the center is dislocated from the center itself. It becomes very quite um, emergent, I would say. And then also the second point is about community solidarity, because. Uh, here, I guess also generally uh, community solidarity is all about how we are doing something for people who share similar identity. So I guess now here what I see is how um, the, the practice is actually cross class, cross identity, even like you just do it uh, for strangers, but strangers with a, with a particular part, uh, precarity that we perceive they are experiencing at the current moment. And then the last point is about civic consciousness. This is quite interesting because it's connected to Kane's um, uh, question about how actually this kind of uh, practice uh, really taps on family or kinship or the citizenship discourses in Indonesia. But so far, what I've seen is that they do not they do not really, they are not really connected to the notion of citizenship. It's just like, oh, we are doing it for to help these people, these poor people, these marginalized people. So the notion of citizenship or protection or, or, or to protect citizens are not really salient in the public discourse. But again, this idea is still very, very, uh, very new to me. And I just like conceptualize it for this uh, presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Henry. Okay, I think we've got a question from Dennis next. Am I now unmuted? You are. Good. Um, no, I was, this really comes out of a discussion I had offline with Henry um, and the comparisons he was making. And what struck me in the discussion is what is so remarkable about COVID is that it actually prevents physical intimacy. Um, and I was very struck if we start thinking about are there parallels with the experience of the AIDS epidemic in the 80s, what is again striking is we're being told we cannot have contact with strangers. We have to stay away. We have to keep our distance. And so what I was suggesting to Henry is that rather than thinking about bathhouses, all of which, of course, are totally off limits at the moment, we might think about the parallels with the buddy systems and the care teams that sprung up where people did actually find ways of creating new forms of solidarity. But 
again, I was struck, and maybe I missed something. It did seem to me that there was a lack of engagement with the physical realities of what COVID has meant. And I was somewhat surprised in a discussion about intimacy that there wasn't actually very much discussion about physical intimacy at all. And maybe I'm speaking out of my own particular experience as someone who lives alone and has a relationship with someone who is, and Helen will story relates to this, someone who is isolated on the other side of the world. But I was struck, as I say, by a lack of physicality in the way people were talking about intimacy. Mm. Good point. Mm. Who wants to take that up? <laughs> Olivia, yeah. I can. I'm not sure I'm going to um, approach this necessarily in the right way um, because I guess my main point of contact besides my son has been with um, my dog. And I initially <laughs> wanted to write about animal intimacies, in fact, and how. Um, you know, our pets have become our closest intimates and there have been, all, again, all these jokes about how the dogs have, you know, been really happy that we're home but the cats aren't and they've been Zoom bombing and, you know, so I've, I've definitely been thinking about the act of physicality and I think in, in Victoria it's been quite interesting as well. Um, you know, I think Dan Andrews has been probably one of the strictest in terms of his um, physical distancing rules. He keeps reiterating, we, you can't go and hug your mother. So it's, we're not even talking about intimacy with strangers but... No. In yeah. terms of the closest people, you know, don't, you'll kill your mum if you go and hug her. Um, there was initially some confusion about whether intimate partners who are living in separate homes could actually visit each other. And they had to clarify, yes, you could actually go, you know, they, they call this a bonk ban. You could, you were you know, banned from going to see your intimate partner, but yes, you could. Um, so there was definitely a lot of confusion about who or, or what in our sphere constituted, you know, our, our intimate bubble, so to speak. And um, so... I mean, I, I, I guess I was trying to approach this idea through Lauren Valance. So returning to this idea about how um, publics become, you know, pers private and, and, and the, the personal becomes public. And really to think about how um, these kind of relationships with people we don't know actually can revolve around quite close. And I, I think a lot of the talks were about this form of care, which while we can't necessarily consider it to be, physically intimate, just you've been bringing people food, allowing them to stay in your home, um, you know, cooking for people, that kind of thing actually is as close to this form of physical intimacy as we can get. Um, but I know that's not really answering the question, but I did, I was really thinking about how to approach the question of the physical, you know, when it's kind of so impossible to do um, under the current, yeah, laws. Missed that last bit. Olivia, mm. could you say that last point again? Um, no, I mean, it was definitely on my mind. I, I, did, I wanted to initially talk about animals because I, I do think that's most people are just petting their pets and that's a way of trying to kind of get some form of physicality. But I, don't, I wasn't sure how else to kind of approach it besides thinking about, yeah, other forms of um, interaction, which were not necessarily physical, but, but certainly bring you into close proximity with others. Right. Mm. Thank you. And did anyone else want to respond to Dennis's question? Oh, yeah. Thank you, Tom. And thanks, uh, Dennis. We already had discussion yes. <laughs> in chat <laughs> together. So, yeah, actually, I really, I, I really appreciate your point. But what I was trying to highlight um, by using the, uh, the gay bathhouses is about uh, straight, uh, how we get intimate with with strangers, with the strangers, rather than highlighting the physical um, intimacy, right? It's just like how we form like affect, effective uh, connections with the strangers. But I guess, yes, um, your point is correct about the J.O. clubs, right? I guess I need to visit that clubs when I'm in Sydney. <laughs> Thank you, Dennis. <laughs> Can I just add something there, Tom? Yeah, yeah. yeah Carlos. Yeah. Just to Dennis, um, I, I, it strikes me that the technological mediation that we've all been dealing with, and that includes like Grinder and Tumblr and a, a long period. I mean, I have a, a dear friend whose uh, relationship broke up after 30 years, and only then did he discover like 
sex acts and promiscuity in his 50s. And that has now gone after three years. Suddenly he's like back with nothing. But he does, he has this bridge of digital encounter, which is not quite 100% satisfying, but certainly seems to go some way. So perhaps that's why the um, physical intimacy question doesn't necessarily pop forward immediately, if you see what I mean, because if, if people have been living digital intimacies, perhaps even more intensely than physical ones for mm. some years before this, then we're kind of dematerialising in what I find it. I, I actually think the Sydney uh, lockout laws have been great training for the lockdown. And actually, yeah. we all have sex online anyway. Now, so. <laughs> speaking among a certain set and value, I guess. We're starting to build up a few questions. So I'm going to, um, we've only got about 20 minutes left. So we'll jump back to the list. Thanks, everyone. Um, Elspeth. Oh, sorry. Helen, were you come wanting to reply to Dennis? Sorry, Elspeth. Back uh, very briefly, very briefly. One of the things I think is very interesting about uh, Dennis's point is that there's a, is it, or can we say that there's been a kind of desexualization of in, intimacy in this moment? Uh, I'm thinking too of, of a, an exhibition actually that I'm currently involved with, which is called Friendship as a Way of Life. And it's in part a sort of response to uh, gay marriage um, in that it's kind of advocating indeed the sort of forms of intimacy other than uh, other than sex um, so I'm just just you know the idea that like for example one of the works talks about um, you know um, that for example you're asked a question um, who are you seeing and you could name all of your good friends and so on and you know that kind of thing so, but I, I just wonder, I'm just throwing this in, is, is, what do, is, is there a kind of, are, are we in a sort of desexualization of intimacy? Um, and and how, how are we to view that? Just quick. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you all. Absolutely um, fantastically interesting panel. Um, I just wanted it's some something of a comment um, with one of my um, master students, Dong uh, Dong Yang. Uh, we've been working through um, Ash Amen, the British geographer's notion of conviviality, conviviality and uh, which reworks commensality. So the sharing of tables um, and um, that, of course, then in this situation brings into play the, the, the gig d deliverers um, who are, you know, <laughs> making possible a different form of commensality, perhaps. But anyway, I just wanted to flag the interesting um, research that Don Yang has been doing, and I think he's online, um, about um, within China, the, the divisions between North and South about what's disgusting and, and what isn't, um, and all of that kind of thick history um, that we have to bring into when you think about conviviality and commensality in multicultural cities, which is what Ash's work is about. And one tiny comment um, about auntie and uncle. When I first came to this country, I found it very weird, and I still do, that non-Indigenous people refer to um, often elders as uh, uh, Indigenous elders as auntie and uncle, um, which I still I do not get how, as colonisers, we dare without being asked to refer to someone as an aunt or an uncle. Thanks. Thanks, Elspeth. Did, was, did you want to reply from anyone in particular or is that an open invitation? Well, it is also to think about, um, you know, as, as Helen was saying, different forms of intimacy other than sexual. Um, eating together is very sensual. And it is also, um, you know, um, 
the the dinner table is kind of that form that in some ways um, enforces uh, the idea of the nuclear family. So they, they do kind of connect up with different things we've been talking about. I have a barking dog, sorry. Uh, go to Anthony. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for a really interesting uh, panel and discussion. Uh, greetings from Adelaide. Um, I was just struck by some of the discussion a few minutes ago where the question of uh, intimacy and uh, uh, being physical was uh, being from the point of view of um, the fact that we are used to being physically intimate and in contact and that the issue at the moment is having to distance ourselves and separate ourselves from others and the way in which a lot of the discussion that we have follows on from this very unusual situation. Um, but in, in, in many places in Asia at the moment, you know, you have large populations of people who are not able to physically distance themselves um, and where uh, so there, there are two things going on here one is the sort of the very much the privilege or class nature of the capacity to physically distance and how that feeds into the discussion but then I'm also interested and particularly if we're thinking about this at a very intimate or personal level about how you, how people process or and how we might think about what people are doing when you're aware of the danger of COVID and, and that situation, but you're also not in a situation where you can physically distance yourself. Um, and so you're, you're trying to manage interpersonal uh, intimacies and relationships, sort of being aware of the fact that that is dangerous to you and dangerous to other people, but actually not being able to do anything about it. Um, and I think in particular at the moment of uh, like uh, the south of Bangladesh, where there's a cyclone going through, uh, and the, the terrible kind of situation that that uh, presents. Um, so that's a kind of a heightened kind of example brought on by combination of the disease and, and natural disaster. But just more generally, generally in, in populations that live together extremely, like in, in, in Singapore with the, the, you know, the second wave in the migrant workers dormitories. You know, how, how do we think about that? So I guess uh, this is my in question to anyone, I, I suppose, not directed at anyone in particular, but and, and partly just wanting wanting us to uh, think think about it from not just from the point of view of people who are struggling with the need to social distance, but also those who simply can't. Thanks, Anthony. Anyone want to reply to that? Well, I, I will say something about that. I mean, I think I think it's absolutely crucial that that we reflect on the specificity, as I think Nafe was suggesting, of the um, familial structures and ideal ideologies of intimacy that uh, lockdown or whatever it might be um, interacts with. I mean, I I lived through SARS in Hong Kong all the way through, which um, taught people there that if everybody wears masks, then everybody is much safer. But even introducing that concept into uh, developed and, and, as in Sydney, quite spacious Western environments has been an incredible struggle. So in a sense, yes, we have the luxury to have houses that we can be locked inside by ourselves, uh, but you look in Hong Kong and people are pouring around the street and they've done quite as good a job as we have of keeping numbers down, but everybody has a mask. Uh, so um, the, the differentiation is quite sharp and, and we, we do not have a universal regime of uh, lockdown, yeah. let alone universal capacity to do those Could things. I make a comment on what Anthony said? Because mm. what's striking about you're right, Anthony. But if you look at the situation in India with my with migrant workers who are trapped, 
they can't socially isolate, but they're also separated often from their own families and their own communities. So in a sense, they're doubly, they're, they're both isolated and thrown together in dangerous situations. Um, and I think, you know, you're right, but it's more complicated. And they're dying on the road. We, we have a question in the chat um, from Kwai Ling. Did you want to ask a question in person or I can read it? Sharon? Yeah, hi. <laughs> uh, okay, um, so I think uh, I raised a question to Olivia about um, this idea of minor intimacy. I'm not sure if I heard it correctly. Just wanted to find out more about the term um, that she used and if she could just elaborate um, on that. Um, also like the fact that she just opposed this display of intimacies in everyday life um, as, as opposed to um, the state um, disciplinary approaches to control social uh, behavior. So that's, that's quite uh, uh, an I mean, uh, important uh, lens. Um, I guess I just want to raise a question to any speaker who is happy to respond as well that, um, I mean, we hear from the speakers and, and um, I mean, we hear a lot of um, goodwill and, and intimate philanthropy that Henry mentioned, a lot of examples, um, virtual intimacies as well as we can see, a lot of Zoom drinks, Zoom dinner, Zoom, all kinds of things. Um, so this, this is really great, but I'm also interested to hear about the breakdown of intimacies, uh, particularly uh, hostility, racism, public outbursts, uh, when people get really frustrated with each other at supermarkets or in parks. Um, sometimes I, I can hear people shouting at each other when they're just jogging. Uh, they just get really, really tense and they start shouting at each other. Um, so just, just worried that, I mean, just, just um, interested to hear about breakdown intimacies during this period. Um, and, and, and now we have a new term for go, uh, fear of going out, which I suffer uh, quite severely from because of, you know, all this tension that's happening in the public spaces. Um, so there's a, a, a general fear of going out. So just want to invite speakers to uh, maybe comment about the breakdown intimacies and also want to speak to what Anthony mentioned about um, uh, class disparity. And I really agree with you that I think that the, pan the pandemic itself really exposes uh, severe income disparity, global hierarchy of citizenship that we have not been really be um, willing to confront. And now it's just really, um, I'm a Singaporean, so I know that migrant workers have been living in, in terrible, terrible, terrible conditions. And so the, the blessing in, in a way is that um, now it's exposed, right? Like it's really out in the open and it really, really forces the government to do something um, and, and to, you know, to take better care of um, one fifth of our population who are migrant workers to take care of them, to treat them with um, respect and to give them a dignified life. Um, so this, this is an important exercise and that's something that I hope that um, governments in different parts of the world will, will exercise their political will to do the right thing. Sorry, I, I took too much time. That's great, thank you. Excellent. Uh, can I just clarify that that's not my term, um, minor intimacies. It's, it's Christine Kims from her book of the same name, um, The Minor Intimacies of Race. Um, and she's talking in relation to um, different kind of cultural productions in Asian American and Asian Canadian public. So I just wanted to um, clarify that. But I was definitely thinking about um, Scott Morrison's um, very uh, inadequate, I guess, response to this um, and how to think through things that are actually happening um, on the ground to create these alternative kind of kinship models that, that everyone's been discussing, you know. And I've been thinking of this especially in relation to um, my international students. So we're having um, all kinds of um, Zoom meetings, um, you know, one-on-one -on -one and also group ones, but um, they're, you know, they're reporting to me greater instances of racism um, and just trying to think through, um, I mean, some, I'm not sure, you know, you're talking about these different outbursts that people have sort of expressed. Um, these might be about different things, but there's certainly a kind of a latent, um, not even latent racism, but um, that, that has emerged in, in full force. And I really um, have been thinking about ways to support these students and, and what to do um, and trying to look into models and, and um, examples that others have been starting up, you know, besides the actual reporting, because there there's so much under-reporting, um, but what to do just to make students feel like they're, they are being supported and there is solidarity. Um, 
you know, we had all this discussion at the beginning before we were talking about whether or not to go to work, you know, what, whether students would say they felt like working in groups with, you know, um, students who had come back from China or from other parts of Asia. Um, and there was certainly, yeah, just a, a real sense that um, people are being discriminated against based on, on where they're coming from, not even necessarily how they're looking like now. So um, I don't really have the answer to that, but I did, I, I did think that idea of minor intimacy was an interesting way of um, maybe approaching um, the, the kinds of unofficial sort of models for, for creating solidarity that, that we're not getting from kind of leadership at the moment. Does anyone else want to respond to that? Vivian, Vivian has something. Yeah. Do you want to come in on that, Vivian? Oh, yes. Sorry, I couldn't find the raise hand function. Sorry about that. Um, thank you very much for the presentations. Um, knowing now that um, the concept of minor intimacy um, existed before COVID, right? I'm very curious, Olivia, to what your thoughts are about how COVID has changed those intimacies and possibly those solidarities. I'm finding it on a personal level um, more challenging, for example, to um, live with some of the micro, micro, not necessarily aggressions, but like discomfort that maybe Sharon's talking about, um, both living with and also um, not living against on purpose, but being Asian Australian, being able to form those networks with international students that previously would have been quite natural and quite easy, which have become challenging. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts about how the situation has reconfigured the ways in which we can have that solidarity. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. I've just been thinking through a couple of things and one is around the idea of risk which I guess, risk. Um, has been written about and, and talked about in different contexts so um, you know how how there are different layers of risk involved in intimacy now that may not have been there before but it was always there so how we reconfigure our relationship to risk and the other one is around um, mental health which actually has only sort of now been kind of you know more prominent in terms of people's thinking about how um, maybe before COVID-19 intimacy was sort of as something that um, provided refuge or safety or some form of stability but at the same time now it creates you know forms of um, fear and risk and um, and we've been told as part of our return to work plan to consider our mental health as one of the pillars of, of how to become intimate again. So, um, I mean, I think it's a really great question. I'm not sure I have the answer to it, um, but I do think it's something to do with uh, about how we assess risk, but yet still take those kinds of risks. And also how, um, yeah, we think about each other's, not just in terms of, of the kind of physical nature of intimacy, but also, um, yeah, about kind of, mental health and how that relates to our interactions with people to you know sort of caring about how people are um and whether or not we do this online or in person it's still kind of another way of being intimate with someone thank you <laughs> okay we have um another question from deska is it hello everyone uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Is it my turn, Tom? It is, yes. Okay. So, uh, thank you everyone for the very, how to say, like insightful panels. I'm very much enjoying this panel, but then um, there are like uh, several things that I would love to ask and um, I would love to comment. And please bear in mind that I am not an expert in sexualities or whatever query it is. So basically this one is only my personal comments. Um, first, let me uh, state my personal opinion that to me this, um, this COVID pandemic is a privilege for those who make like beyond the basic living where they can say with the family and work from home like what Henry said so they can just taking selfie to be uploaded uh, to be uploaded in their personal Instagram uh, however this pandemic is not the privilege for those who are living um, as a daily workers right 
uh, Henry give, uh, gives us an example, like for instance, the motorbike taxi driver. So I would love to rest. Um, so long while ago, like uh, Kane, uh, Kane um, how to say, like uh, ask Henry whether it is um, a family kinship whatsoever. And then I'm, you know, to strengthen Henry's opinions, um, I would say that it is, uh, no, it is basically, uh, it is basically, uh, how to say, like, like we 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 are sharing like the we are sharing like the same uh, the same feeling, or uh, how to say how to put it in the right words like uh, we we share like the same the same things that we 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 feel the urge to help others. I uh, mind you also that I come from a small city in Indonesia named Yogyakarta, and. Uh, as an example, I can give you a week, uh, like weeks ago, we established a public kitchen to distribute uh, the food to daily workers, particularly to female porters and the traditional, uh, in the traditional market. And so-called our marginalized friends, like for instance, we also deliver the food to the shelters from those people infected with HIV. And in, in Jogjakarta, we also have, um, in Jogjakarta, we also have like a, a a boarding house uh, specialized for those um, we call transgenders who are living there and we distribute the food to them. So, uh, uh, so this, this kind of thing shows us also that surprisingly with the number of homophobias, you know, in Indonesia that keep increasing, I found out that those LGBT agencies, you know, uh, the, the help for those people are increasing also. And there is one, imp uh, there is one, one, one comment from Miss uh, Links that I also highlight here. I'm sorry, I, 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 I will just shorten out. Uh, uh, Miss Quatling says the breakdown on the COVID. Well, I am not an expert in, in, in uh, like she, she gave an examples like racism and so on. I am not an expert in queer, uh, but then I conduct, uh, what I can give is based on my personal uh, experience. I, I am conducting a research in female and, uh, female and children terrorism in Indonesia. And so basically with this COVID-19, Miss, uh, Miss Ling, uh, you know, even though there is the physical distensions and so on, but the number of the virtual caliphate and the numbers of the people who are uh, people who are how to say like involved in the act of terrorism is also increasing also. So basically, the breakdowns of in the intimacies that we are talking here, you know, it's 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 not only. It's not only related to something physical, but there is there is a bone that we are sharing here. Thank you. Yes, we we need to get a response to that, and because we just have a few minutes left. Thanks, Vivi. Does anyone want to respond? We have one more question. If not, then we'll. Go I think to... we should take the question so we can. Well, let's... Sort of a question of a question. Did you, um, from the comments, Fiona? Did you want to ask, a, raise your your question? Yeah, please. Um, yeah. Hi, sure. Thanks, everyone. Um, I guess I'll make it quick since we have a few minutes left. I think how um, Naife was talking about um, intimacies and how um, you know certain kind of family formations, which you know she reminded us is an institution, kind of suddenly um, proliferate in a time of pandemic might be instructive in terms of teaching us how to talk about race. Um, so much of the conversations about racism, um, for example, in Australia so far, have focused on, um, you know, things like the racial abuses, attacks, um, and so on. You know, and the example that Olivia raised about how um, Pierre Morrison, right, will tell people to stop, um, you know, doing all that bad stuff, but at the same time are also passing policies that say, you know what, um, the help stops at temporary visa holders. Um, it's not gonna go that far. So it's that contradiction of, um, you know, watch your behavior, but our policies are reproducing, um, you know, structural forms of racism. So it, it yeah, so I guess that's um, my comment, but it would also be great to hear a little bit more about, um, you know, racism in that way, um, not just kind of the verbal interactional, but uh, when it's sort of baked and built into our institutions and how the pandemic is, you know, intensifying that in various ways. Thanks. Thanks. I'll just make a very brief uh, response to that. I, I'd say uh, 
uh, an historical response, actually. One of the things that is very striking about the 1900 period, which is the period of the formation of Australia, is to be acquainted again or reminded again of how inherently racist it is, how it is all about um, white supremacy. Um, even the engagement of the colonial troops in, in um, the Boer War, which was one of the other major stories of the, of the moment that I'm concerned with, um, it, it's pointed out that the, the reason that the British were there was that they were helping the Boers to, to uh, win the place for the white race. Um, and right throughout this period, the, the very formation of Australia as a nation is, 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 is a white Australia, as we know. Um, and uh, though, of course, we've talked about this for the last 50 years, um, it's very interesting to, to be reminded uh, or, um, about it again because of the daily sort of in, encounter we have with the reality for it, for... Mm -hmm. For, um, for so many people in Australia now. And if, if I could add a postscript to that, I think um, you cannot understand or even meaningfully talk about structural racism in Australia in the absence of reflection on labour force management. I mean, that is what it has been about for over 100 years. It's not often raised in representation-oriented discussions of racism. Um, or structural things that just look at one institution, the institution we happen to be in, for example. Um, racism in Australia has always been produced in relation to how you control the labour force. And you can see that in, in Scott Morrison's regime's more shameful step, like a month after saying, go home, it's like, okay, now we'll bring international students back, maybe. You know, like, without the question being raised of why the hell would they want to come back after having been treated in that manner? So that dehumanising approach um, is, is really, really structural and really deep-rooted. And there actually is a lot of discussion about it, but it tends not to be in cultural spaces, it's in, it's in history. And I think it's a resource that we can draw on much more um, in joining up with people who are dealing with labour crises during, during this period, including fruit picking and all of the, the work that people have done uh, for us. So that's, you know, but I think that's absolutely vital that Fiona raised this question. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So we're sort of out of time now. Is it um, anything else, Megan, from your end? Oh, no, just um, I wanted to say quickly to Olivia that I don't know if you see there's a Facebook page called the Aussie Muslim. That's wonderful. You know, the, the picture is Catherine Deneuve, I think. I mean, a gorgeous French film star with a scarf around her head, looking really elegant in a 1950s film. But they posted something the other day saying um, being an Arab after 9-11 was like being Chinese and sneezing your way through Bunnings um, in this current period. And, yes, it was amusing, but I thought it was extraordinarily pointed about the extent to which um, the discussion about racism in Australia needs to be broadened and also have a memory because one of the characteristics of Australian public racism is it goes in a circle and the light stops on different groups over, over the, the decades um, and how we, we build a genuinely cross-sectoral discussion of that. Um, is something quite separate at the moment, I think, from the broader geopolitics of uh, COVID, you know. So, 
Um, I think you would like the Aussie Muslim. It's a very, yeah, very well. And I'll, I'll definitely look that up. And it's a fantastic point, um, something that's preoccupying me now, um, yeah, about the cyclical nature of this and what we might be able to do about it. Thank you. So um, you should all have a link to drinks, which is separate. Um, most of us will go and get ourselves a drink and uh, return on the other link. But I'd really love to thank our speakers. That was the most wonderful, wonderful session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.